Welcome back, everyone. Um, let's continue uh, in Acts chapter 9. Uh, but before we go any further, if there are comments or just something that you wanted to share from your understanding, it'd be nice to talk about it a little bit and then continue. Or well, anything that touched you. Okay, who would like to share? Can I try? Yes, we can. I think uh, from what I'm observed, there's a disconnect in the book, writings, and the spiritual spirituality. Because you get to get the cases, cases where God is use, using things than expected, than expected. But eventually, through prayers and listening, listening to the whole Holy Spirit, now you can get the get the connection. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kennedy. So, yeah, we seem very disconnected, different episodes, incidents, but through the. Um, work of the Holy Spirit and the leading, you see how everything is being orchestrated beautifully. It's like music. We don't, individually, it might sound different, but when you put it together, the synchrony sounds amazing. So thank God uh, for the direction of God, direction of the Holy Spirit through the book of Acts. Uh, Kung shares God worked through the personality of Saul. Yeah, that's true. So each one of us, who can depend on that whoever we are it, that doesn't limit god he can work through it he can use it for his glory yeah any other any other thoughts any other inputs All right, so we shall proceed. Okay, there's a comment from Asha, how God uses people to connect to his children, to display his works among his children. Yeah, that's, that's also correct. So we saw names of different people and how God uh, you know, connected them. So we will uh, proceed. So, so far we've seen that uh, Saul accepts Christ, God reveals uh, his purpose, for Saul, we see that um, he's connected to the body of believers. Uh, and uh, initially, he was in Damascus, but the Jews threatened him. So he had to move out of there, goes to Jerusalem, not very accepted by the apostles there. But through Barnabas, uh, there is uh, you know, some level of uh, acceptance. Uh, but even in Jerusalem, when he begins to minister, uh, people rise up against him, Jews rise up against him. So now he's finally sent back to his own town. Remember Tarsus. Tarsus is where Saul is from. So he goes back to Tarsus. But while all of this is happening, so we are back at uh, uh, verse 31 here. Uh, so if I may request someone to read from verse 31, to verses 43. Not very long. Someone can quickly read it, then I can go ahead and explain that section. Ma'am, yes, not 31 to 42. Yeah, end of the chapter. Okay. Please so the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. 
it multiplied. Now, as Peter went here and there among them all, he came down also to the saints who lived at, lived at Lydia, Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas, bedridden for eight years, who was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. And immediately he rose. And all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. Dorcas restored to life. Now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. In those days, she became ill and died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in, a, in an upper wood. Since Lida was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, please come to us without delay. So Peter rose and went with them, and when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all outside and knelt down and prayed, and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up, and he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he, repre he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And he stayed in Joppa for many days with Simon Etana. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Rupa, for reading uh, the remaining of chapter 9. So there are, so far, it was only about Saul. Okay, so now Luke begins to talk about other things and another person from verse 31. So we have to understand, while, while eventually Luke will bring the focus to Apostle Paul, uh, he is describing that entire season. I said that Acts uh, is, is about three decades, 30 years, and what happened from the time of the birth of the early church uh, and how you know, believers were scattered during persecution and in the entire region, many churches uh, began to be planted, thrive and grow. So we, we are looking at, you know, different uh, narrations here and there, but we have to put the big picture together. So right now we've seen uh, about the conversion of uh, Saul and uh, suddenly Luke begins to say, that the church is in the region. So where are these churches? Judea, Galilee, Samaria. So there are, there are churches. Okay, so at this point, it says churches throughout all Judea. Just in the previous chapter, chapter 8, he said Philip went to Samaria to preach Christ. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. The right next chapter, he says churches of Samaria. So there is a body of believers in that region of Samaria now, a strong body of believers. Okay, so such as the ministry of the early apostles and the believers, wherever they went, wherever they ministered, a group, a body of believers was, you know, uh, touched by the gospel. And, you know, they, uh, they gave their lives to Christ and then they began to grow. And uh, eventually they are known as a church of that particular region. So he, he uh, Luke says, throughout all Judea, Galilee, Samaria, okay, these churches, what was the condition? What was the status of these churches? They had peace and were edified. Was it a time of persecution? Yes, it was a time of persecution. But somehow, you know, there was peace that the churches experienced and edified. We know it means being built up. So the churches were built up. So churches are thriving at this time. You know, parallelly, persecution is taking place in that region. Then he says two components you know, that really were, uh, 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 that describe these churches. Walking in the fear of the Lord. So what kind of churches were these? These were churches that were walking in the fear of the Lord. We must remember that. So the churches were, had peace and they were built up, 
but these were churches that were walking in the fear of the Lord and what else? In the comfort of the Holy Spirit. In the comfort of the Holy Spirit. So this is the way you know, in which these churches were uh, growing. And we are told they were multiplied. So churches are growing, churches are thriving. The work of God is continuing in a very, very powerful way. So now the seed shifts to Peter. So far, we talked about Paul. So now coming to Peter. So Peter is continuing his ministry. Just like how we saw earlier, uh, when the apostles come to know that the region is touched, they go. They do the, you know, the next step of leading people into Holy Spirit baptism and whatever else is required. So Peter is again on his journey. So where does he come this time around? Well, he comes to a place to call Lydda. And notice uh, the, the passage says, saints who dwell in Lydda. How did saints come in Lydda? So the picture we get is the gospel is spreading far and wide. So even a place called Lydda, who are saints? Saints are uh, sinners who have now been saved. That's all. So there were believers. In other words, believers. There were believers who dwelt in Lydda. So there is a body of believers in a place called Lydda. So Peter goes there. What does he find there? Somehow, you know, Luke, the doctor, he wants to um, talk about the power of God. In Acts 3, he talked about how a man who was lame for 40 years from birth started walking. So again, he brings the highlight to these amazing healings, amazing miracles of God. So he just puts the focus on one event in Lydda. What is that event? So there was a man by the name Aeneas. He was bedridden eight years and was paralyzed. Coming from Luke, we know what he's talking about. Okay? So this man couldn't move. Eight years. What happened? Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ heals you. Arise and make your bed. Then he arose immediately. Sounds familiar? These disciples are ministering the way Jesus ministered. When he was alive and remember what jesus said in um uh, john 14 12 he said you shall do greater works than these so here are his disciples moving in greater works just the way jesus said take up your bed and walk here is peter telling Aeneas, jesus the christ heals you and uh, make your bed so then he arose immediately wow astonishing a healing takes place right there, right then. So what happens when people see uh, a notable miracle? What happened uh, in, in Acts 3? Many believed, okay? The church began to grow because of a supernatural um, happening. So even now, when something supernatural takes place, what's happening to the people of Lydda? So all who dwelt at Lydda and Shad saw him and turned to the Lord. So this is the nature of the supernatural. When something supernatural takes place in the name of Jesus, what happens to the hearts of the people? It's turned towards the Lord. And that is why we must pray and say, God, we want to see more of your power, more of your glory and as miracles take place. People will be drawn to who this God is and how great you know, his glory is. So Peter is putting that on display. Now he moves on at Joppa. So it's like, hey, there's Peter's itinerary, place to place. Later to now, where has he come? Joppa. There was a certain disciple named Tabitha. So amazing. Saints in Lida, disciple in Joppa. So everywhere people have started believing. Many people have started believing. Who is this disciple now? Her name is Tabitha, translated Donkis. Okay. Uh, so what is the speciality of this particular uh, lady? Full of good works and charitable deeds. So here is a believer, you know, the kind of believer that uh, any church family would love. She used to do good works and charitable deeds. But unfortunately, she became sick and died. Okay. And what did they do? As 
uh, tradition would would uh, have it they washed her cleaned her put her in the upper room so they were just preparing for her burial and since lida was near jopar the disciples had heard that peter was there they sent two men to him imploring him not to delay in coming to them so again just think about this we said the churches were growing okay we said that the apostles were going and doing the work of the ministry but here is the additional thing what is that the faith of the believers the faith of the believers dorcas died or tabitha you know tabitha died leave it at that but what happened when they saw that tabitha died and they knew that peter was close by he said lida the faith of these believers is so evident what did they do they sent two men to him imploring him not to delay in coming to them so what were they believing they were believing that even the dead will rise so that is the faith of the early church so they called they called for peter said come fast peter please come minister okay so peter then peter arose and went with them was 39 when he had come they brought him to the upper room and all the widows stood by him weeping showing the tunics and garments which dorcas had made while she was with them sounds familiar yes jairus's daughter died people were weeping they were wailing but jesus went and said you know little girl come up you know come on rise up so the scene is so similar and it's so beautiful to see that the disciples of jesus are ministering just like jesus how are they able to do this the same holy spirit who worked with jesus worked through jesus is working through the disciples and that is why jesus had told them wait till you are endowed from on high with the holy spirit and then you go you shall be my witnesses in you know jerusalem judea samaria and to the ends of the earth so here they are empowered by the holy spirit ministering even to somebody who is dead so when peter comes very uh, you know discouraging sight there people are holding up things that she made um, tunics and garments and they are just weeping and grieving the death of tabitha but peter put them all out and knelt down and prayed and turning to the body he said tabitha arise so what is peter doing in both these cases he commands okay he commands earlier he commands you know healing and wholeness he says arise make your bed in the next situation he says tabitha arise so the command of god goes with the authority of god and we know that the word of god carries the power of god so that command okay what did it do scripture say and she opened her eyes and when she saw peter she sat up so life came in at that point when peter commanded her okay as a resurrection so how do we know she's dead very clearly they washed her later on the upper room they would have known and they have instructed peter come quickly peter please come and people around are crying so uh, it's very clear cut that here is a dead woman who rose back to life as peter ministered to her so these are the works of the early church miracles healings resurrections so they are moving they are not just moving and establishing churches but they are demonstrating the supernatural wherever they go okay so tabitha sits up and then we are told you know peter gave her his hand lifted her up and when he had called the saints and widows he presented her alive so what is the result another miracle has taken place what is the result was 42 and it became known throughout all jopa and many believed on the lord so this is what the supernatural does people start to put their faith in god when there is a demonstration of the supernatural power of god okay and another interesting thing was 43 is very interesting okay it says and it was that he stayed many days in jopa with simon a tanner so would somebody like to tell me why is this interesting verse 43 
He stayed with Simon the Tanner. Who is this? Peter. Why is it interesting? You can give it a shot. May I try? Yes, yes, please, Candy. I think it describes the minute what it does, his profession. Yeah, so uh, Kennedy, you're saying because of his profession? He describes, describes him by what he does, mm. by his profession. Oh. Like Simon the Tetana. Okay. Somebody oh. may be working at Tetana, right? <laughs> Mm, okay, very nice. Thank you, Kennedy, for that. So, so far we saw Saul of Tarsus, Jesus of Nazareth. Okay, so they are identified by the places that they come from. But now in Joppa, we know he is Simon of Joppa, I would say that, but something more specific, Simon the Tanner. And the um, understanding is that devout Jews would not associate with tanners because this was a profession that involved you know um, working with animals dead animals and their skin so uh, traditionally people who were tanners were asked to live out of you know the the uh, dwelling communities of other jews so they were not uh, accepted you could say the tanners were not well accepted by the other jews so Knowing the kind of person Peter is, Peter, you know, he's about traditions, he's about, uh, you know, uh, very, like, sort of strong-willed uh, individual, uh, not very accepting of, you know, the Gentiles and all. So being a person like that, for him to stay with the Tanner, so... By now, you know, years, some years have passed. And, uh, you know, Peter was born again right after Jesus' resurrection. In, Act, in John 20, we see that Jesus breathes on the disciples. Receive ye the Holy Spirit. We know that the born-again experience is the moment when the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in us. So when Jesus was walking on the face of the earth, they were not born again because the Holy Spirit didn't come to dwell in them. But at John 20, Jesus breathes on them. Okay, so they were born again at that point. From then to now, there has been a transformation of the kind of people you know, each one of these disciples were. Peter, we would expect him to reject a tanner, but we are told being a Jew, he stays in the house of Simon the tanner for several days. So that in itself tells us that Peter's heart has softened. He's begun to understand that our God is a God of all people. Whether they are accepted by the society, they're not accepted by the society. Earlier, which set of people did we have who were not accepted by the Jews, or not very, um, you know, honored by the Jews? Do you remember any group of people? Samaritans. Yes, that's right. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Sarupa. So, Samaritans where such people now a tanner so everyone is part of the kingdom of god and the apostles are beginning to realize that so he's staying in the house of a tanner without any you know uh, sense of shame for several days so that just shows how deep the apostles have gotten in and they don't mind tanner or you know bus city no the other thing is, in uh, these times, ministers of God were hosted in homes. That's how they went city to city. Can we no longer do that? No, we just maybe uh, go and stay in a hotel or a hostel, something like that. But in the times of Acts, the way they would minister is go to a, a place, stay in somebody's home. And that's what we see. 
Okay, now let's move on to Acts chapter 10. Another very, very uh, interesting uh, passage here. And uh, uh, the key person who ministers in this passage is also Peter. So somehow, you know, we don't have any talk about uh, this great uh, uh, man who, who encountered God, Saul, you know, anymore in Acts chapter 10. So it's, it's more about Peter. So what's happening in Acts chapter 10? Uh, I would request one person to quickly read through the entire chapter. So then it becomes easy for us to uh, you know, describe what's taking place. Okay. Uh, so one of you could, uh, you know, uh, or let me know. I'll quickly read Asha's comment here. She says, I think... The news that spread of the miracle of Tabitha, many people also were coming to know Christ of what has been done. Something wonderful is happening. Uh, my guess is that he was motivated and also encouraged to continue job. Okay, sure, sure, Asha. So Peter was encouraged to stay on in Chopa. So who would like to read that step? Um, shall I read? Yes, sister. Go ahead, please. Chapter 10. Uh, Acts chapter 10. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave, gave alms gener generously to the people and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius, and he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your arms have ascended as a memorial before God, and now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him, and having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray, and he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But when they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens open and something like a great sheet descending being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is calmer or unclean. And the voice came again to him again a second time, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, behold, the man who was sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon was the, was called Peter, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man, who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have, say, have to say. So he invited them in to be his guests. The next day he rose and went away with them and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. And on the following day they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. And Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I too am a man. 
and as he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person former or unclean. So when I said I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked them, then why you sent for me? And Cornelius said, four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your arms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. So I sent for you at once, and you have been kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. Gentiles hear the good news. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God, that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that has he that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know that happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judged of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still saying those things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word, and the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed, because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured upon even on the Gentiles. But they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. Thank you. Thank you still very good passage. Uh, I really appreciate you reading the entire passage. The reason why I wanted us to do it this way is now we have the flow and we, you know, understood uh, how things really happened uh, regarding Peter's ministry to Cornelius you know, and his uh, family. So I'll just go over some of the key points. It's quite self-explanatory. We saw that uh, now Peter was staying in Joppa, Simon the Tanner's house, and. In Caesarea, okay, there is a man called Cornelius. Uh, the way this man is described, so we we try to understand each person here. So Simon the Tanner, what can we say about him? He must have been a believer, okay? Our assumption because Peter chose to stay in his house. All right. What else do we know about Simon the Tanner? Generous, hospitable, you know, uh, hospitable. That's why he's allowed Peter to stay there. He must have been. Uh, you know, part of the church in Joppa. Now, talking about Cornelius from Caesarea, uh, what is his uh, uh, profession? We are told that he's a centurion of the Italian regiment. Uh, not only that, he was well respected. He was well respected, good reputation. We saw later uh, that, that uh, you know, that was told about him. So he's a good man. Uh, he is. Uh, he is probably doing good work professionally. In addition to that, what about his character? We are told he is devout, one who feared God, 
uh, with all his household who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. So uh, he's not a Jew for sure because later we saw that he's described as a Gentile. So he's a Gentile, but he's a devout Gentile. Devout Gentile. So people who were not Jews and yet who were uh, devout, they are known as proselytes. So he was one of those devout people and we are also told he's from another nation so this is the description of uh, Cornelius but here is the thing he feared God he kept the practices of the Jews so he was seeking this God without knowing about this God okay so he was uh, he probably had the old testament then he had the scriptures of the old testament but he did not understand about the redeeming work of Jesus Christ and his heart is hungry to know it. So look at the way God orchestrates. Even in Acts 9, we saw God spoke to Ananias, God spoke to Paul and made a connection there. In Acts 10, supernatural, the you know, leading of the Holy Spirit, God is speaking to Cornelius because he wants to know something. He wants to know the truth. And God is speaking to Peter and saying, you go, you speak to Cornelius. So God is making this divine connection and how beautiful. Sometimes we might think that there can be devout people who are seeking God but they don't know about Jesus. They don't know how to be born again. What is the common way in which people are born again? By the sharing of the gospel. Okay, But there are these exceptions. We had an encounter which Saul had. We had, we see that Cornelius has a vision. So what are all the things that can happen in a vision? God can show us, you know, what is going to happen. He can speak to us. He can reveal, you know, things uh, in the form of a picture or, uh, you know, uh, not just a still picture, but a motion picture where you're seeing things taking place in a vision. But in the vision of Cornelius, okay, verse 3, he saw an angel coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. So there is an angel bringing a message in this vision. So that is the experience of Cornelius. So different, isn't it? Everywhere it's so different. So an angel brings a message. What is the message? The message is about Peter. But okay, here is this man, Peter, in Dopa. Uh, he is in Simon Tanner's house. So, you know, you send, to, uh, send your people and have him come over. So Cornelius is obedient to that. He calls two of his household servants, uh, a devout soldier, explains everything to them, and he sends them parallelly. It's like a movie. So here is God speaking to Cornelius. But parallelly, Peter, again a devout Jew. So another thing we notice is after these people accept Christ, Peter and all the apostles and all, they're still keeping some of the good Jewish traditions. Okay, what were these good Jewish traditions? The times of prayer, we, do, we know that the Jews prayed three times a day. So it is obvious that they continue to do this because earlier, Acts 3, they went to the temple. Okay, at the time of prayer. And now in the afternoon, what does Peter do? He goes to the house stop to pray about the sixth hour. So that sixth hour is a time when the Jews pray. So Peter is just doing uh, his, his uh, you know, faith-related uh, duties or obligations and such. So he goes to pray. Because it was lunchtime, we are told he becomes very hungry and wanted to eat. And look at the, the uh, you know, God's sense of humor. He uses the physical condition of Peter to speak to him. Peter is hungry. Okay. So there is a vision which Peter sees about eating. So God is connecting the physical situation to a spiritual truth that he wants to bring to Peter. So, you know, God is working in all these amazing ways. We don't know why, you know, he picks uh, things like this. So anyway, so what does Peter see? He has a vision. He sees heaven open and an object like a great sheep bound at the cord, four corners, descending to him and let down to the earth. So this is what he's seeing. And on that sheep, when 
all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Verse 13. So, uh, but if we go back to the Old Testament, and the laws that God had given, the laws of hygiene, laws of, uh, uh, you know, like dietary laws for his people, there's something like kosher animals, non-kosher animals. So there was a classification. Uh, one could not eat all the animals or all the, you know, all the parts of the, the animals. So there were these dietary laws which were given to God's people. But in the vision, Peter is seeing all animals and he's getting an instruction which says, rice, Peter, kill and eat. So the kind of, uh, you know, person that Peter was, you know, sometimes we have uh, uh, the right answers that we want to give God. So Peter is trying to impress God with his theological knowledge. And he says, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. So he brings up, you know, common or unclean. Uh, that was the uh, description of the animals that he was not supposed to eat. So he was just letting God know that, God, I know my scriptures. I know I'm not supposed to eat every animal. Okay. So he would have thought, oh, I'm going to get 100 out of 100 because I'm giving the right answer to God. But the voice spoke to him a second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times and the object was taken up into heaven again. So the repetition of three times, whenever God repeats a, a message, he's very keen on getting that message across to a person. Okay, what else do we observe here? So Peter saw this vision, the sheep came, animals, he was asked a question, he answered, the instruction was told to him, and the sheep went away. Okay, wonderful. But did Peter understand what it meant? So, 117 says he wondered within himself what this vision which he had seen meant. So, he didn't understand. So, sometimes it happens to us also. We see something, we don't know what it means. But, you know, continue to pray and ask God, God, what did you really mean by it? What did you really mean? mean by it so he's wondering but why he's wondering you know the men whom Cornelius had sent they came to the house where Peter was staying so they were at the gate and they called and asked whether Simon whose surname was Peter was lodging there so God had given specific instructions to go and meet this man Simon whose surname was Peter so they were already at the gate so again while Peter was Thinking about the vision, verse 19, while Peter thought about the vision, he still didn't get it. What was this all about? What was God trying to say? The Spirit said to him, so you see the different ways in which God is speaking? Vision, an angel in a vision, a voice. Uh, and now again, you know, we, we see the Spirit said to him, so Holy Spirit is speaking to Peter. So in his heart, he's hearing this message, behold, Three men are seeking you. Very specific. There are three people. They want you. Get up. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. So Peter wants explanation for the vision. But you see, God thinks it's important to give some other instruction at that point and says, Peter, just go. Three people are waiting for you. Thank God. You know, uh, Peter goes. Thank God obedience he just goes he didn't understand the vision but you know he chooses to go and what happens he goes there and he tells them yes i'm the person that you are asking for and they let him know that cornelius okay cornelius and they describe what kind of a person cornelius is he wants peter to go you know to his house so at that point i think you know, Peter probably was getting the message. You know, sometimes slowly we understand maybe that process was happening in Peter's heart. And Peter just goes. Okay, he, he goes with these three people the next day. He comes to Cornelius's house. 
So when he comes to Cornelius' house, the beautiful thing is, you know, Cornelius is this man, it seems like he wants to bless everyone. He knows oh, God gave me a vision and he's sending, you know, one of his uh, men. So I will get blessed, but I want everyone I know to get blessed. So only Cornelius wasn't waiting there. He had his relatives and his close friends also. We have some people like that, right? We know uh, some such people. They always bring their friends and everyone they know so that everyone can receive the blessing. So Cornelius had brought people together with him. And uh, uh, then you know, they have this conversation. Both of them exchange notes and they share how, uh, you know, God told Cornelius that uh, you go and uh, you send people to bring Peter and uh, uh, Peter, you know, he kind of begins to understand. Yeah, so Peter also shares this a particular thing that it's not it's not a good thing for a Jew to interact with a person of another nation. So in verse 28, he also states this. Uh, but see what Peter says. He says, then he said to them, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of uh, uh, another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or common or unclean. So while they're exchanging notes, you see, Peter got the message from the time he came down, spoke to those men, and he reached Cornelius' house in Caesarea. Do you see? He is sharing the interpretation of the vision that he saw, that what that meant, you know, don't call any animal unclean, actually meant that people should not be called unclean. God loves all people. And you know, the word of the gospel must go out to all people. So then you know, from verse 34, we see that Peter preaches Jesus. So they had not heard about salvation. So Peter preaches Jesus to them. And next thing that you notice in verse 44, he never gave an altar call. Did he give an altar call in his first sermon, Acts chapter 2? He did. Okay, in a sense. So the response of the people, they were cut to heart and they believed in Jesus Christ. But you see the work of the Holy Spirit here. Peter was just telling about Jesus. Verse 44 says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. So how amazing, how amazing. So that shows us that they probably believed as they were listening to Peter. So faith came in those moments. They became born again. Who does the Holy Spirit fall upon? It falls upon those who are born again, isn't it? So these people, without laying of hands, without an invitation, were baptized in the Holy Spirit. When Peter was speaking, it says, okay, amazing, amazing. And uh, people were able to hear them speaking in tongues and magnifying God. So when Peter saw this, he said, verse 47, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. So a couple of things that take place in Acts chapter 10. The gospel goes to the Gentiles through the household of Cornelius for the first time. Second, when people are born again, you know, the Holy Spirit falls on them. So Holy Spirit baptism happens first, strangely in this case, water baptism happens later. Okay? You don't see this before Acts 10, but only in Acts 10, People first received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. They just started speaking in tongues. No laying on of hands, no praying, nothing. And then when he sees this, Peter says, how can I stop you from being baptized in water? And so they are baptized in water. Okay. So uh, that is uh, about how the gospel is going to different sections of the society, different regions. Um, there's so much more to come. 
from Acts chapter 11. So I'll stop right here. We'll pray at close today's class. And uh, next class, I'm not too sure if I will be able to take it, uh, but I will let you know maybe half an hour prior uh, to the class because I'm traveling. So I'm trying to, you know, teach. I don't know. Okay, I think I'll have to start calling people's names. Okay, Abhinash. <laughs> Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful time to equip ourselves, Father God. Thank you that you spoke the words through man, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. It was so powerful, so wonderful, Lord. So amazing, Father God, to receive your words, Father God. Thank you that you used that you used normal people, Father God, ordinary people, ordinary people to use for your kingdom, Father God. And we believe that, Lord Jesus, as we are learning and hearing, Father God, sometimes we feel we are ordinary, but you work through the ordinary people, Lord Jesus. We believe, Lord Jesus, Father God, that you are going to do things which we are not able to see or think. And we pray that, Lord Jesus, let it, your Holy Spirit will be the shine upon through us, Lord Jesus. And wherever we go, let it help us to be in salt and light, Father God. And especially we pray for the ma'am, Lord. Thank you that you have given her a beautiful teaching skill, Father God. And we pray that, Lord Jesus, give her more grace to equip herself, Father God. And she will extend his, extend his level, Father God. Thank you, Lord. We commit all the students to your mighty hand, Jesus. And rest of the time at the moment, we submit to your mighty hand, God. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Everyone, so um, yeah, great to be blessed by what the Lord is speaking to you. And, uh, the week after. So,